Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. Today, we're going to check out a model that we have seen before, but I wanted to document it again because I found something a little bit strange when this one showed up on Reverb a couple of years ago. So, the Les Paul Catalina is essentially the very first chambered Les Paul that was offered by the Custom Shop. Now, there are some asterisks with that because technically the Bantam Customs, you know, those F-hold ones, did come before, but those guys, they've got F-holes. These guys, they don't. They're a more traditional Les Paul, despite a lot of other things being changed. So in my eyes, this is the first chambered Les Paul. They didn't really do anything to modify the appearance of these guys. But if we really, really want to get picky, apparently there were a few 50s Les Pauls that were actually chambered out by the factory for Mary Ford. So we're arguing between two different models when it might not even actually matter. <laughs> but anyways, what makes a Catalina a Catalina besides the chambered out body? You had some exotic finishes. When they were first introduced for 1997, they were offered in Riverside Red, a Canary Yellow, and a Cascade Green finish. But towards the end of the series, occasionally you can find other colors. Maybe it's because Gibson thought people didn't like these fruity flavors, and that's why they weren't selling as well as they were hoping. But you can find evidence of one called Black Pearl on the internet. And that thing is so cool. It's like a black with a sparkle in it. It looks good. So when I saw this thing get listed on Reverb late one night, I thought I had finally found my Black Pearl. It was my holy grail moment. It was here. But when I got it, there's no sparkles in the finish. <laughs> so if you're a Catalina collector, there's actually a lot of weird custom ordered one-off colors. Maybe it was a dealer exclusive. I'm really not entirely too sure how many other colors there might be. But besides this one, there has also been like a light gray colored one. It almost looks black at most angles, but when you get it in the light just right, you can see the grayness. And the serial number on the back of that one is still stamped in black, so you can see the color difference. This guy right here, you can tell it was meant to be black because I have a white serial number. Black would not show up on that. So what I have right here to share with you guys is an incredibly rare, potentially one-off, I doubt it, but I've never seen another one in this, the complete ebony finish, Les Paul Catalina. So what else makes the Catalina special? They had an ebony fretboard with real mother of pearl inlays. You gotta remember, Les Paul standards actually have the acrylic. It's Les Paul customs that get the true mother of pearl. So that made these special on top of getting an ebony fretboard, kind of like the Heritage 80 Elites. But then you also got these really cool Perloid pick guards, Perloid truss rod covers, and the Gibson Custom Shop logo. So as they were kind of blowing these things out, trying different colors, they pretty much ended up turning this series into what we know as the Les Paul Elegant series. So instead of being fruity, solid color finishes, they've got all these beautiful flame tops, quilted tops, exotic finishes. In the transition from Catalina into Elegant, they lost their headstock binding. They kept this logo, the Custom Shop logo, for another year, year and a half before they did away with that for a more traditional Les Paul silkscreen. So that can be a difference depending on what year your elegant is. But these Catalinas, they were only around for about a year, 1997 to about 1998 or so. You might find one before or after, depending, you know, super late in the year, super early, but those are the general year spans here. And the elegance lasted for much, much, much longer, you know, 1998 till about 2004, if I remember correctly. And then you can also learn about the SG elegance that took over from there. So the Catalinas, they birthed so much. They're very historically significant and collectible in that nature. However, most players, they generally just go for the elegance because these are solid color finishes. But if you prefer solid colors, that's why you would seek one of these out, or if you just happen to like the fancy pick guards. But to learn a little bit more about this rare ebony finished Catalina, let's go ahead and throw it on the workbench and take an individual look at its parts and specs. Well, it took a little bit of elbow grease, but man, this thing, it, it just came back to life once you cleaned it up. 
So before we dig into this, I did want to comment a little bit more on the Catalina. I think more and more people are starting to appreciate these because you used to be able to pick these up for like 2,000 to 2,800 bucks. Now they're starting to get scarce on the market and I, I think the only one for sale right now is actually by Norm's Rare Guitars and he wants four and a half thousand dollars for a common finish one. So let's find out why are people all of a sudden gravitating towards these things. These are custom shop guitars, but they are not historically specced. We do not have an ABR1 bridge on this thing. It's a Nashville style, AKA the Tunematic. So it has studs within the body. It's not historically correct. And we do not have a long neck tenon. It's just a regular short neck here, kind of like the Gibson USAs. So that's what makes it different from like a historic reissue in this time period. Cause you have to remember the custom shop right now is very new. It just came out in late 1993. 94's that first full year, and these guys are what, 97's, 98's? That's within the first couple of years. They were just trying to figure out what the heck do we do with the custom shop. We know the reissues are cool, but what else can we do that's cool? And this is one of those first models, you know, outside of the Bantams and things like that. So the pickups in here are 57 Classics. They just read patent applied for, and a regular 57 Classic in the bridge. So there's no 57 Plus or Super 57s at this point in time. But here you can see what the cavities look like for each of these. This guitar actually has a really nice patina over everything, so I know this is the original finish. But it almost gave me a shock. I thought, does this have like a solid top? Is it a mahogany top? Because everything looks pretty uniform right there. No, it's got a maple top and a mahogany body. You can actually see the seam line right here for the two-piece maple top before it reaches onto that mahogany down there. So it's a regular spec Les Paul in that aspect. As far as our pickup readings, 7.65k ohms in our bridge within the circuit and 7.9k ohms in our neck. Middle position just for fun, 3.88. That's about what I'd be expecting. But bridge and tailpiece, we were kind of talking about this before. This bridge is actually slightly collapsed. And the way to tell if your bridge is collapsed, you need to put a straight edge on it. And if you see a bow right there and light coming through, that means you've got issues. Because bridges are radiused just like the fretboards are. So if you're ever getting some buzzing in your middle strings, it's because this no longer has the proper radius. The reason for that is people always think they need to take their tailpiece and deck it down to the body. They think that gives them ultimate sustain and it's awesome, but you're actually destroying your bridge depending on your neck angle. When you string it up, you should be able to get a little feeler gauge underneath the string. If you can't, that means over time you are collapsing your bridge. Here, I'll show you what I'm talking about. So you should be able to take like a piece of paper and be able to get it under the string before it touches down to the back of the bridge. If you struggle to be able to do that, that means you're collapsing your bridge. Now, some of them, they just collapse over time because of the pressure. I mean, this thing's a pretty old guitar at this point. And I feel like that's something more and more people should disclose because I see it all the time, collapsed bridges. It's not a big deal. I mean, you could just replace the bridge, try to bend it back. I mean, for this, it's more of a collector's example, so I'm just gonna leave it as is. The backside of the bridge reads made in Germany. So that tells you it's a Schaller made part. After you have your bridge and tailpiece set up correctly, if you don't like how tall it sits up, you can always top wrap your guitar. As far as the tailpiece on this one, it is full weight and it actually has a bar going all the way across it. But now let's take a second to appreciate the plastics. So obviously the pick guard is the fanciest thing on this. Now thankfully it doesn't look like these things off gas and shrink and crack like the real deal stuff. So it's probably just a perloid material. But they didn't go too crazy on us. It's not like they made the poker chip out of that. They decided the rest of the plastics should just be white. And this is a crisp white. I mean, look at it against this black finish. This is awesome. I love this coloration. Normally I'm not a big fan of ebony finished guitars because of all the scratches and stuff. But the fact that we've got the ebony fretboard, the ebony finish, the blinding white mother of pearl inlays, you've got the big old gaudy inlays on the headstock too that are white, the plastics. The pick guard, this whole thing just works. I mean, just having a little bit of sparkle for that black pearl one, that's the only thing this one's missing. But hey, you know, it's a, another color to collect. But then strangely enough, all these Catalinas have black speed knobs. I feel like a white knob or a pearloid knob would have made more sense, but no. They all have black. That's why on things like my Santa's Les Paul episode, somebody replaced it with red and white knobs. It's very common for people to swap out Catalina knobs because, you know, they just felt 
they did not choose the right color, but that is factory stock. Two volumes, two tones, nothing fancy as far as the electronics go with push pulls or anything like that. Standard stuff. But you can see, these have a beautiful dish carve to them. And as far as our condition here, yeah, there's a small ding right here. And you've got some scratches being a black finish, but overall, I would say I'm pretty happy with the condition of this. There's a small ding right here because of your pick guard, small crack in your knob. So moving on from that chambered out mahogany body, two-piece maple top, you've got a mahogany neck and the ebony fretboard. Again, Mother of Pearl inlays, 22 medium jumbo style frets. Things are pretty basic here, but what I'm really curious about is does this have the compound radius of the elegance. Those guys go from, I think it's like 10 to 14 inches instead of being the standard 12. To me, it looks like it does have the compound radius. 10 inches up top and about 14 here. That's what it looks like to me. I could be wrong, but I'm the one measuring it here. 12 inches just seems to have a little bit more play. And you can definitely see some light shining through under there. So I'm gonna go ahead and say it. I, I do believe the Catalina's also had the compound radius. Checking our scale length, 24 three quarters. They didn't change anything with that. This example actually has some decent fret wear on the second fret right here. I know it's so shiny because I just polished them, but there is some wear there, so somebody was playing this thing. But other than that, I only noticed like a little bit, you know, up to here, and then around here, somewhere around here, there was a very small ridge. That normally happens because somebody doesn't put paper between the strings when they ship it. But thankfully, it doesn't look like the kind that's going to catch the string or anything like that. But you've got the cream binding along the side with the dots. They're not abalone though, like the elegance. Although that would have been really sweet if they would have made them white mother of pearl, but black sticks out a bit more. Grab our rest of our neck specs, 1.7 inches at the nut, 2.07 by the 12th. First fret neck depth, 0.84, and 0.96 by the 12th. Those measurements definitely make it seem a little bit bigger than it feels here on the bench, but it really does beef up towards the heel right here. So if you like those kind of skinnier feeling necks here, like kind of 60s territory that transitions into slightly more 50s-esque, that's the best way I would describe it, but let's go ahead and see it on the contour gauge. Here's what that looks like at the first and 12th fret. You can kind of see how slim that is now. Moving on to the headstock, some guys don't like the gaudy custom shop logo, some guys do. I've come to appreciate it more and more as a collector because Gibson just doesn't really do a lot of stuff like this. You can find some of the old art guitars in this era that would have it, and that tells you that's one of the early ones. But it just says custom shop in a mother of pearl banner, then Les Paul instead of Les Paul model in a silk screen. But we can see our truss rod in here as well as the mahogany neck. Everything's looking good. Unfortunately, there's like a, a little burn mark right here. I, I don't know what melted the lacquer a little bit. I tried polishing it off, but to no avail. So that's a blemish that's on this particular one. But other than that, just some uh, light lines around the logo, some fine scratches. But man, generally, I don't like binding on standard style guitars on the headstock. I think it looks cheesy. But this one, I like it because it's that whole black white theme they've got going on. It kind of reminds me of the Celebrity series. Les Paul, I mean, there's also other guitars within the Celebrity series, but this is very similar to that now that I'm thinking about it. Maybe that's why I like this guitar so much. And here's a look at that truss rod. Same material as the pickguard. Very cool. But anyways, let's go ahead and swap over to the back side. I got this all cleaned up too, but there are a few blemishes that we can point out. If we can see past all the glare anyways. So you've got some buckle worming marks in this area. And then it's really hard to see it now, but there's a line that runs straight up and down here. That looks like some sort of like alcohol or something went down there and kind of discolored the finish. Not necessarily a seam line in this case. It was more apparent. You might have been able to see it in the unboxing segment. But now that I polished this up, it's kind of harder to see, but there it's showing. Got some dings right here from a strap. I mean, this was definitely somebody's player. Back has its fair share of impressions. But thankfully, it's a black finish. It hides most of it. But there's also a small area right there in the corner where the finish got rubbed through, showing the bare mahogany. And there's another one of those areas right here by the heel. And going up the back side of the neck, you can see some impressions. Maybe that was a capo or something. And a few more in this area. Looks like another small rub through area in the corner there. 
Maybe a small one right there, but everything else is looking good. So this dates to 1998, 9648. That's your production number. You've got your Grover tuners on here. Looks like the only replaced part on this guy are black Dunlop strap locks. Not my favorite, but that's easy enough to swap out. Looks like on the side of this one, it's got some sort of a smudge from rubbing up against something. But looking at the other side, you just kind of see that lacquer sinking line, but I would say that's pretty much the worst thing condition wise on the edge is on that other one. You got a few other light dings, but you've got the thick binding in the cutaway for these guys. But now let's dive into the most unique thing about the Les Paul Catalina series, its custom shop chambering system. So when we talk chambering in Gibson USA, those chambers aren't actually all connected. They're just chambered spots within the bodies. Different chambering styles produces different tones. So even if you've tried a USA and you didn't like their chambering system, try one of the custom shop Catalinas because this is one solid continuous chamber. And thankfully I've got the endoscope so I can show you that. But first let's look at the electronics. Just like with many late nineties custom shop Gibsons, you get the combination of CTS style pots that have the cool codes. So 13797 making this a 1997 pot. Looks like 50 some week where the rest of that's covered. It looks like this one says 51st week, so very late 97 pots. And then the other two are Gibson branded. So it's in the late 90s when they kind of transition into those Gibson branded pots. But now let's take a look inside. Okay, let's dive inside the Les Paul Catalina. So this is looking up the horn more so towards the toggle switch. You can see you've got this little cavity right past the pots. You can see it actually kind of swoops in because that's the side of the Les Paul body, but it actually has quite a bit of a buildup around that too. So there's just a very small cavity right here. And as we poke our head around the corner, you're just going to see the end of the Les Paul cutaway. So there's just a little chamber that goes up there. All this wood was removed simply to reduce some of the weight. So that was that area of the guitar. Now let's take a look at the center block. So right here you can see where the wires are coming out for the toggle switch and the bridge pickup. But as you're seeing up here, there is no cutout for that neck pickup because it all just runs through that channel. But then as you move around here, you can see that center block actually has like a little curvy bit to it right there. Before, as you go over here, it just abruptly stops. So there's nothing in the center of this guitar. But as you look at the edge of the body, once again, you can see that little hump right here and that's where they sink the strap button into. That way you don't have to worry about cracking the wood because it's too thin. So that's always good to see. But here we're just looking at the edge of the guitar, the chambered out mahogany. And then as I was telling you guys earlier, this is one continuous chamber. So if we poke our head around here, we should see the toggle switch, which always proves to be a difficult thing to do. Yeah, there it is. So it's quite a skinny channel on the other side, but they are all connected. So now let's go through the toggle switch cavity route. That gives us a slightly better view of what we saw. It's kind of like what we just saw on the other side of the guitar though. However, if we look around here, there should be a cutout into the center block, which is right here by the neck pickup. It just enters that cavity right there. So chambered out from here, all around there gets kind of small, but it's all connected. The only thing I find myself wishing that they would have done different for this is gave it the pearloid back plates. Those things did exist. You could buy them separately. I actually had new old stock ones at one point in time. That was a long time ago, but that would have looked particularly sweet on this one. Maybe go as far as like giving it a white stinger too, but that's probably asking too much. But this is indeed a factory black one, just in case you missed it earlier, because you've got the black paint right in here. Everything else is the natural wooden color. So I have no qualms to the authenticity of this paint job. Of course, we gotta do the black light test too. Everything is glowing the way I would expect to see on a 98. Top finish looks good. Face of the headstock is also glowing. You can see that burn or whatever it was a little bit more clearly there. Backside of the guitar, further proof that that was something that discolored the finish or ate it or something because you can see that under black light. So a drip of alcohol or a not very safe polishing compound or something would be my guess. We'll take a look around the edges here. Looks like uh, some sort of a discoloration there. I never noticed that in regular lighting. That's that scuff mark. And looks like maybe a stand rash or something down there. We've got something going on there. Some sort of a touch up it looks like. 
but it's not all around the base. So it's almost like maybe this just cracked a little bit and somebody's like, uh oh, let's touch it up. Because it could also be a heel break that had some sort of a repair, but the finish is perfect along the edge. So that just looks like a cosmetic touch-up to me, but a touch-up nonetheless. You can also see another touch-up area right here that did look a little bit more white in person in that area. So there must have been like a finished chip or something happened up here. And then we've got some stand rash right here that you can only see in blacklight situations. The rest of the headstock is definitely looking fine to me. There you go. That's why you blacklight things, especially right after you buy them. This example is actually really light for a Catalina too. Despite them being chambered, most of them are still like nine, nine and a half pounds. But this guy, eight pounds, 3.4 ounces, not too bad. Let's go ahead, plug it in and hear how it sounds. Full disclosure, now that I'm actually playing this guitar, I can tell two of the knobs have been replaced. If you look at the font, the bottom ones are the original ones. They have a nice big font to them, but the top ones, they're kind of small, but they match. So I guess, technically possible they, they might have been like that they were transitioning but i honestly don't know so let's just say two of them have been replaced but let's go ahead and uh toy around with this starting with our neck position say this is the smoothest playing guitar I've played all night and that's out of three of them there's something about this it's a really low action on this guitar and it's super cool to look at it's very visually pleasing so this is just right the kind of guitar that I like but of course there's more to just clean tones on a Les Paul let's kick in some distortion <laughs>
Now that we know all about this rare Black Catalina, what are my final thoughts on this thing? Out of the three guitars I demoed tonight, I like this one the best. It just has something special to it. I don't know if it's the custom shop chambering or if it's just the way it looks or if it's just the nice weight. This was definitely the lightest guitar I demoed tonight as well. Or maybe it's just the fact that this is a really rare color variation on the Catalina series. It just looks so good. It plays nicely. It's got super low action, ebony fretboard bound. It's just a really cool black and white guitar. So are Catalinas for everybody? No, but they're for people who like solid colors on Les Pauls that have some pretty fancy attributes to them. Whether you think it's gaudy with the headstock binding and everything or not, I'll just leave that up to you. Normally I am in that camp as well, but this one with this color combination, I think it looks really cool. So, troglodytes, I hope you have a new appreciation for the Gibson Catalina model today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care. As always, if you're interested in being the next owner of one of these demo guitars, you can check them out on my website, troglysguitarshow.com. There's some links in the description.